Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to workshop seven. Uh, we are going to talk about and discuss our visions for diverse and resilient rural areas here in this workshop. This is a very complex theme, but uh, luckily we have a great team of moderators and facilitators and speakers with us. And of course, we also have you and uh, we do count on your, your activity uh, and, your, and your sharing your views. So our facilitators are Elena Di Federico, Laura Yalas Loki, and Miles Stifler, and they will be working with you in the breakout groups and introduce our excellent expert speakers as well. Now I'm trying to share my screen for a very short intro introductory presentation, and then we move on to the two keynote presentations before we go into <coughs> excuse me before we go into the actual breakout sessions. So I hope you can see the presentation. I have a little bit of that one. Sorry, just a second. I have a problem with the share screen function on this. Yeah. So, so housekeeping rules. <clears throat> if you can, you see the. The slides, can somebody get back to me because I cannot see them on my screen? Yes, it's fine, Peter. Okay, thank it's you very much. So, sorry, for housekeeping rules, so please keep your microphones off when you don't speak and write in the chat and raise your hand when you wish to speak. So this is very important. So we know that you want to, you, you want to speak and share with us. And my special request to you is when you speak, please, please share your video. So it makes it more personal. It gives it a more personal touch. Um, Going to the agenda, we have a very short introductory part here with two keynote presentations that are coming up very soon. And then we have a, a breakout sessions, four breakout sessions, uh, which we are going to move into. And uh, in these breakout sessions, we will discuss different uh, aspects of resilience and diversity in the rural areas, uh, share some expert views as well. And then we come back for a synthesis of messages from the breakout sessions. Moving to the next slide. Uh, I would like to share with you only two of the many definitions of resilience. Uh, I am showing you two of them here. I highlighted some aspects of these definitions and they relate to the ability to recover from shocks, uh, adaptation, transformation and structural change, and as well as balance between various functions, economic ecosystem and cultural functions. I think and I would like to suggest that we should keep these, all of these in mind when discussing the vision for 2040. When I focus today, uh, we are looking at two main questions. One of them, and, and you might be familiar with these questions already, the key elements of a vision for diverse and resilient rural areas by 2040, and the step changes need to, needed to get to this vision from the current uh, situation. And uh, we aim to take a fresh look at the lessons learned from the COVID crisis and discuss the kinds of investments and main changes needed to strengthen the sustainability of rural areas and strengthen their resilience to future shocks. <clears throat> Some other questions might come up. And of course, we have to keep in mind that the COVID crisis is not the only one that we are facing. There's an ongoing and con continuous uh, challenge which is posed by climate change. And in this context, it's very important to keep this in mind when we talk about resilience as well. We also need to look at uh, how uh, rural communities and rural areas can react and respond to the challenges of climate change. <clears throat> Some additional questions that may come up, uh, like adaptation will be necessary, but will it be enough? Can rural areas shape their own future amongst serious challenges driven by global processes? Is it enough to have more 
more of investments, more of participation, more of awareness raising, or should we also change the way we do things? And uh, there are a range of options for change and for building resilience, but when we think about change, do we think about incremental step-by-step -step small changes, or we think about radical structural changes or something in between? And finally, is a diversity and resilience agenda ever completed, or does this require continuous adaptation, learning, and action? I think these are very important points to consider when we talk about resilience and when we think about our discussions today. And last but not least, uh, I would like to show up you are excellent speakers. Uh, they aim to give you two different points of view, two different types of points of view during the discussions today. We, we give you the research and policy and more overarching broader views and also the local perspectives through local action group uh, presenters in the different sessions. Uh, <clears throat> and I think without further ado, ado, we should go into the first uh, keynote presentation. I would like to introduce to you um, Amelie Krug. And uh, Amelie is a council member of ECOLIS, the European Network for Community-Led Initiatives on Climate Change and Sustainability. And she is one of the original promoters of Communities for Future. She has also been active in uh, the Baltic Eco Village Network. She has a keen interest in our food system, rural development, and sustainability, sustainability issues. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I would like to give the floor to Emily for her keynote presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, um, thank you, Peter. Um, thank you, uh, you for the introduction and for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to talk to you about community-led initiatives as catalyzers of diversity and resilience in rural areas. Diversity in a sense of a peaceful coexistence of diverse cultures and of humans and other species and resilience in a sense of a transformation of the systems that are currently causing frequent shocks and breakdowns. So what are some of the challenges with regard to those aims? One of the main threats to rural resilience and diversity are the numerous planetary health crises that we are experiencing. In the face of this climate crisis and the sixth max extinction in the history of our planet, we've reduced the size of freshwater populations by over 80 percent, lost one half of the world's rainforest, and we're in the midst of a global pandemic. If we continue on this trajectory, we will not survive as a species, and many people, especially those living in the global south, are already now suffering and dying as a consequence of our destructive behaviors. One of the main causes of our current circumstances is the growth-based and profit-oriented globalized economy with the highly, highly complex systems that make us very vulnerable. The needs of people living in rural areas and elsewhere depend on global supply chains and thus on the functioning of this complex economic system. The economic stability itself relies on ever-increasing inputs of energy, derived from inherently limited resources. In the food and agriculture sector, the number of companies dominating the market is now very limited, with a few powerful monopolies concentrating wealth and power. Some of this can be explained by the hegemonic cultural paradigms in Western European societies. First and foremost, the economic paradigm that promotes the values of productivity, growth, efficiency, and profit. Other challenges to resilience and diversity lie within the center periphery relationship between urban and rural areas. While rural areas are being depleted, cities tend to be much better equipped with infrastructure, have more diverse populations, have more to offer in terms of economic and cultural activities. This is only one phase of the rising inequalities within and beyond European societies. Another threat to diversity is the rise of the far right, which is a growing problem in rural areas with the far right's intolerance of any diversity in perspective, values, religion, lifestyle, and ethnicity. 
On the political side, many governments have enacted policies that are threatening rural diversity and resilience with decades long policies favorizing large and competitive companies, world trade and deregulation. All of this culminates in a situation that causes many shocks which resilient rural areas need to be able to recover from or try to avoid in the first place. So what are the opportunities? One of the opportunities to address this situation is that of transformative capacity. We are now waking up to the fact that we have created systems that have increasingly eroded resilience and diversity, and that we are now capable of anticipating what this will lead to in the future if we don't change. On the political side, there are also positive developments and the policy landscape is shifting. The European Green Deal, the UN Agenda 2030, the Paris Agreement have become priorities and protecting the climate and the environment will be a central goal within the EU programs of the next funding period. With regards to resilience, there is an adaptive cycle that is common to all socio-ecological systems which go through successive phases of growth, stability, decay and reorganization and renewal. So as we are experiencing these challenges, shocks and collapses, we are entering in a phase in which a system is particularly sensitive to influence and where small changes may affect it to shift to a new and more desirable state. What we can learn from ecosystems is that innovations happen at the local level and then spread to the global scale and thus influence the trajectory of the next regeneration phase. Community-led initiatives are well equipped to be these local innovators. Across Europe, thousands of communities are already pioneering the change that needs to happen in order to further resilience and diversity of rural areas. Networks of diverse stakeholders and policy frameworks can help to spread these innovations throughout Europe and beyond. This brings me to our long-term rural vision. The future of diverse and resilient rural areas in Europe is one in which rural areas and communities provide for basic needs of human survival and flourishing in a sustainable way by assuring that the basic needs of the world's present and future generations are met. Rural communities will reconstruct the concepts of wealth, progress and work, commit to responsible production, consumption and trade, cultivate social entrepreneurship for local regeneration, increase economic justice through sharing and collaboration and ensure equitable access to land and resources. They will nurture diversity and cohesion and develop fair, effective and accountable institutions. They will grow seeds, food and soil through regenerative agriculture, clean and replenish sources and cycles of water, move towards 100% renewable energy and transport. They will innovate and spread green building technologies and work with waste as a valuable resource. Our rural communities will ask themselves how to become a healing regenerative influence on the ecosystems which they inhabit. By implementing innovations which are bio-inspired in their design, they will extract carbon from the atmosphere and capture and store it in the soil and biomaterials. In the process, they will make soil fertile again and ensure ample water flow and rain and the replenishment of long dry fountains. Diverse and resilient communities and re regions will be partially independent from the globalized economic system by ensuring that life sustaining well being will be met at the local and regional scale with special focus on energy, food, and water. At the same time, rural areas will keep the capacity to meet basic needs at the national and global scale. So when there is a disruption at one scale, they can use backup systems that happen at different scales. So how do we get there? We need to address barriers and potentials for community-led initiatives and ensure support for community-led action through policies and funding. For example, through the expansion of the community-led local development funds. We need to act in accordance with the scientific evidence 
on the potentials and barriers to community-led action, its impact on strengthening the resilience, diversity, and sustainability of rural areas. And we need to fund further research to understand even better what is needed to support community-led action. Rural areas need to form multi-stakeholder partnerships working together towards agreed goals and thus create the potential for both rapid local transition and catalyzing wider societal transformation. Central to those partnerships is the analysis, visioning and planning process. It is a process similar to that one that we are doing here collectively today at the European level, and it needs to be also implemented at the local and regional scale by the people living and working in those areas. One of the very concrete steps in this context, we as Ecolis have taken in order to move towards this desired future is our Communities for Future program. It builds on the experience of many thousands of communities that have been pioneering new regenerative and resilient approaches to sustainable living at the community level. The aims of the program are to create a cohesive and integrated network of change-making stakeholders that co-create and inspire a holistic culture of regeneration. We strive to create a widespread public and political awareness of the potential of empowered communities and to positively transform societies to help reach ambitious local to global policy goals. Communities for Future aspires to establish a dynamic and inclusive framework for collaboration, sharing of knowledge, research, learning and capacity building to support communities to engage in and spread transformative action on the ground. Networks such as the European Network for Rural Development and other networks involved in the local development and sustainability are most definitely invited to join us in this shared endeavor. So thank you for listening and for more information, please see the following social media channels. You can also reach out to us during this week visit our marketplace and contact Ecolis, for example, by using my email address, and I'll make sure that your questions are answered by the appropriate person. Thank you so much, Emily. Certainly a lot of food for thought, uh, good analysis of the situation and a lot of hopeful messages as well. Uh, now I would like to introduce our second keynote speaker, Carolina works as a territory and geospatial analyst at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. Uh, she is particularly focused on the development of land use modeling platform under EU scenarios, especially for territorial impact assessment and policy analysis, like uh, in areas like agriculture, land degradation, renewable energy, population dynamics, and other themes. She has also been involved in the development and analysis of rural related indicators, giving scientific and policy support to different DGs in demography, digitalization, urban-rural interactions, including regional typologies. So, Carolina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody, for being here today and for the invitation to this uh, event, Rural Vision Week. And uh, I would like to, today to share with you some aspects that are coming from our own work, our own uh, expertise. And then uh, my, my um, presentation here, or the title that I put in this presentation is quite broad uh, question, but uh, it's are the EU territories designing the resilience capacity to forward looking challenges from a holistic perspective? It's, uh, we have seen that resilience is quite complex uh, and multidimensional uh, concept, but uh, uh, this is, at least I would like to give some nuances, some aspects from our work. So first of all, uh, some initial considerations, because uh, we, of course, we, we, we are talking about rural areas, but from an kind of, uh, analytical point of view and comparison, uh, national comparison, uh, international comparison, we need a common definition of rural areas. In this case, uh, we rely on the degree of urbanization from different regional levels that is adopted uh, as a definition of cities, towns, and rural areas. Also, another concept that we are 
Tokil, and you have you have been presenting two uh, definitions of resilience. I have just uh, select one related to more with the focus on territories. Is the resilience the capacity that a territory has to respond to challenges without jeopardizing current and future well-being? So resilience. We have many shocks to to currently. We have a financial crisis, a economic uh, crisis, climate change has really related with the previous presentation from Amelie, natural disasters, demographic challenges, political conflict. So all these uh, are different uh, aspects that we, we need to, uh, to, to, to deal with, to, to be resilient to. So from our own work, uh, I have put here some uh, um, aspect and uh, related to challenges and trends from current data analysis, but also with uh, uh, projections. We, uh, with our territorial modeling platform, which is called LUISA, uh, has the main output, the main outputs are uh, land function, demographic and accessibility uh, projections. So with this, uh, here I bring just some, some, uh, some aspects. Uh, of course, we know that the, the, the rural areas in Europe are very diverse in many different aspects. This is uh, obvious. And then this influence the making decision processes as well. And then we need to look at place to place. So really local, local uh, aspects. So uh, in terms of demographic uh, challenges, we have seen that uh, uh, even in the whole Europe, uh, the, there is a common trend and it's a trend that is aging population. Also, this is accentuated in rural and remote areas, but not alone, but not alone aging population. This goal is combined with a decline in shrinking of labor force and also a decline in young population. This together with some uh, the population uh, trend that also it's, 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 it's uh, uh, important in some areas in Europe, this, this combination of demographic challenges create a, a really important challenges in, in, in at, at local level, but also regional level. So in terms of uh, economic development, always uh, in general, uh, rural areas uh, and especially remote areas uh, goes behind in economic development and performance. So we always think about the agriculture sector in this case, but we need to, to, to extend these to other sectors important uh, in rural areas and with high potential as for instance, industry sectors or, or uh, Tourism sectors, not maybe in this uh, specific moment, but more focus on eco, eco tourism or, or some other things. So, uh, also rural residents face greater difficulties in accessing basic services and also internet connection. And this is really related with the demographic challenges that we've been talking before, because this, uh, if we have elderly, uh, a, a high share of elderly population in some areas, also these basic services has to be adapted to those needs, to these new needs. And also in the other way around, if we have less young people, maybe we need less schools. So it's some example that we need to start to thinking to adapt it. Um, related to the, the, environment, the environment, also uh, uh, forest and natural areas play a, a very important role uh, in rural areas, uh, especially with focus on the transition to the low, uh, low carbon economy. So this is also an important point. So with these uh, aspects, uh, I'm wondering if we can measure, or of course we can include many others, measuring the resilience, the local resilience, regional resilience, to really tackle these uh, challenges and trends from an effective, uh, with effective policies. For this, we need data, data, we need tools, methods, scenarios, observatories to help us to measure this resilience. So uh, our vision, our how we imagine the future of rural areas, uh, I have put also some aspects to shape in this future that uh, to be more, res more resilient rural areas. Uh, uh, I'm thinking on more innovative, technological and productive rural areas, uh, more connected. We have been talking a, a lot about this in other presentation as well, physically, digitally and socially connected rural areas, more economically diversified. It's good to have uh, different sectors, uh, and also this is connected probably with uh, specialization in some sectors and using a smart specialization strategies for that. 
uh, more demographically balanced, educated, and skilled uh, rural population living in rural areas. And this is again related to the, uh, the, the demographic challenges, not only in terms of uh, age groups, also in terms of genders, because we know that uh, uh, there is a, a gender gap in employment, for instance. The woman usually it's uh, have uh, it's the, the rate of women working in, in rural areas is less than, than male, for instance. But also there is a, a importance to be well educated people and skilled because this attract uh, knowledge and innovation to rural areas. So we would like to see more fair, inclusive, and equality rural areas, more efficient and accountable institutions. Rural areas need strong. Uh, local governments, I will say even further, not local, even regional and national governments, and of course, the uh, res more respectful to the environment because protection of environment also is uh, important for the mitigation of uh, climate change effects and, and, and other important things. So the actions or the changes that we need to do from my view <laughs> to get this desirable future is a more active conversation among rural communities, uh, governments, and stakeholders, uh, effective rural networks and clusters. I, I have called it a rural hubs or rural social hubs with kind of a, a, a hierarchical uh, structure that I would like also to uh, bring this idea to the uh, economy. So it's important to have strong links between among rural, uh, between rural areas, but also with uh, cities, with the, the main urban centers. So these uh, hubs can be in the form of logistic hubs, economic hubs, manufacturing hubs that help and foster these linkages and make more resilient rural areas and also cities uh, at the same time. So how to incre increase the economic activities and put the specialization in the value add services and for instance, trad also tradable uh, sector and make more efficient provis the provision of basic services, digitalization and technological innovation, protection of nature along with a sustainable and viable agriculture and forest, uh, also a uh, more efficient fiscal policies, sustainable and competitive, more incentives in this sense, probably with focus on rural areas at local level, and with all the aspects maybe could help to chart targeted local strategies and financial instruments to make rural more attractive, inclusive, and green to keep people living there and also to attract new newcomers to the areas. So this has been my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And uh, you can find us, uh, me and my team, my group, our group, in these uh, uh, web uh, social media channels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. This has been, again, a lot of food for thought, and we count on both you and Amelie's uh, participation also in the breakout sessions. Uh, thank you again. And without further ado, we will break to the sessions. We will look at, look at this theme, resilience and diversity in four different perspectives, communities, environment, economy, and interactions. And now I would like to ask our technician colleagues and support to move us to the breakout sessions and see you back in about 40 minutes. Thank you. And I hope it will happen soon again. Um, okay, if everybody's here, um, just yes, Marianne and uh, Matthias are here. So let's start. So this is a breakout session where we are going to talk about, in particular, about communities. We talk about resilience from a community perspective. So how can communities, how can rural communities in different ways contribute to the resilience of rural areas? Um, because the most difficult part of a breakout room is always to get people started, we volunteered two people to help us get started and break the ice. So we are starting, and we thank them very much for their availability. So I would start with Mar Delgado. 
Um, Mari is a, Maria, in fact, is an agricultural engineer and professor at the Department of Agricultural Economics, Sociology and Policy at the University of Cordoba in Spain. And she's the local director of the Erasmus Mundus International Master on Rural Development. She specializes in policy analysis for the development of rural areas and in sustainability science. Um, and she has participated in several relevant global initiatives coordinated by UNESCO, the FAO, the World Bank, the United Nations. And she's also involved in several Horizon 2020 projects on sus rural sustainability and rural communities. So after such a presentation, we have high expectations. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, so Mark, the floor is yours. Okay, Elena, thank you very much. I'm very pleased and very honored to have this opportunity. And in order to give time to our participants to express their views, I would just start with my, my ideas. If I have to look about resilient rural areas in 2040, my first thought is that since all essential goods and services for life and quality of life, such as food, water, energy, landscape, oxygen, are produced and provided by rural areas, by 2040, the real value of these assets is fully recognized, not only in monetary terms, but also in institutional and social terms. Rural communities play a stewardship role on these resources, and this role is fully recognized by all citizens and consequently prized and valued. Land, food, and water are considered as global commons, and as such, no one can be excluded of the right of access to these goods and services. These resources are not anymore managed as exclusively public or exclusively private goods, and we go beyond the traditional market state dichotomy. These resources are managed by rural communities and are bottom-up, polycentric, self-governance system based on collective actions, but connected at the global level. Rural communities have the capacity to self-organize and manage these resources, and they do following the principles of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. In order to avoid both over-exploitation and under-provisioning of these essential goods and services for human life. Rural communities have a high level of autonomy and the capacity to make strategic choices. These areas are not anymore marginalized or subordinated to urban areas. There are not patronizing or solidarity approaches from rural areas, but a multi-level governance system, system in which rural and urban areas are equal players. Technology, including digital technologies, together with local knowledge and territorial identity, are used to manage resources, and people in rural areas have diversified, qualified, and well-paid jobs. Rural communities have similar access to services than urban areas. And I raise these issues because I'm really worried about the recent trends of land and natural resource grabbing and the subsequent enclosures that are happening everywhere, including Europe right now. And also by the increasing presence and interest of investment funds, private equity, and other financial companies in land and agri-food production system that are driving to an increasing speculation on these essential goods and services. So in short, rural resilience requires recognition valuing the goods and services provided, multi-level governance, human and ecocentric approaches, a primary role for the local level, bottom-up collective actions, jobs and incomes from different sectors, and a good provision of services, uh, all essential services uh, for citizens. Thank you very much, and I hope that uh, you react to my words and that can open the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mar. That looks like a great vision for the future, really. 
Uh, let's see what Matthias has to say. So Matthias Wagner is uh, um, our second voluntary icebreaker or volunteered icebreaker. Matthias is the manager of the local action group Leipziger Mildenland in Germany, which I surely mispronounce. Uh, and he supports the implementation of their local development strategy, which features a, a wide range of themes from youth involvement and the local economy to dealing with sustainability issues and much more. So Matthias, what's your view for resilience and the role of communities? So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Elena, for the introduction. Um, when I thought uh, about the rural vision, um, it was, uh, and, and concerning resilience in diverse rural areas, it was, um, as we as we saw in um, the, the last uh, 20 minutes, it's, it's a very complex theme. From my opinion and my experiences from the last 12, 13 years working as a lag manager, um, for, for me is um, that we need um, a strong urban rural relationship between urban and rural areas. We need um, inter-municipal uh, corporations um, in our lag region. Um, more small communities are working together because they are um, offering service and basic functions and administration tasks together. So they are working on a rural area and a rural level together to be stronger together. And um, uh, it is more and more important to be part of regional networks, um, for example, the leader network or other networks um, in um, the area, but also um, beyond uh, the, the, the regional level, um, because these networks are important for funding, for regional networking, for transnational exchanges and to raise the awareness for several themes in uh, the, re the regions and the rural areas. Um, from, from my regional side, um, the keywords for um, resilient rural areas is that communities um, have to unite and um, uh, different stakeholders, as uh, it was mentioned before already, and different actors in, in the region. For example, in, in my leg area, um, we are working together with young people, with administrations, with entrepreneurs, with cultural um, actors. So it's a, a, a wide range of, of actors um, in, in this community-led uh, local um, development. Um, in, in the last five years, we have made good experiences with our community and uh, with, with the common local and regional strategy for our development in our region. Um, we had the chances to um, try out new local approaches and that is important for the next years to, to widen that approach and to keep that approach. Um, we need uh, funding and good funding uh, possibilities and long-term funding possibilities. That's uh, very important for um, lots of projects in our area. And um, I think flexible funding um, uh, is, is also um, very important. Um, maybe some projects uh, from our uh, actual um, funding period. Um, we, we talked about the economy and um, so regional products uh, are very important, but uh, also a, a wide uh, range of the regional economy and um, new forms of mobility and new work, co-working, remote work is very important for rural areas. And, and of course, the, the water uh, um, um, safe um, uh, projects and, and also um, to, to um, the, the climate change problem to, to raise the awareness and sensibility for that is um, very important. And as we are thinking about a new development strategy for the next years, these are the, the core points for, our, the, the, for the resilient area in, in our leg. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthias. There's a lot of food for thought in these two uh, first interventions. So I would like to 
invite everybody to uh, to share their views, their experiences. There was a lot here. We've heard about recognition. We've heard about recognition of the importance of rural areas and the goods and services that are provided there. We've heard about local global connections. So we've heard about the importance of uh, rural urban uh, um, relationships, so there's a dimension, the uh, territorial dimension there, and also cooperation with neighboring areas, networking at the regional level, but also, of course, bottom up uh, action and local partnerships. These are obviously important. Well, coming from a local action group, it's obviously uh, it's quite obvious, but um, because these are integral for a leader approach, but there is more. So I would like to invite everyone actually to even open up your microphone now and just take the floor whenever you want. So whoever wants to take the floor, Vanessa, I see you've duly raised your uh, hand. So please feel free to, be, to start. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I thought I would just throw in at the beginning a, a couple of provocations really about this. Um, I mean, I've been involved in rural development for about 35 years, more than that now, actually. So um, I kind of you know, got a long track record. And during the whole of that time, the presentations we've heard, yes, you know, we have been advocating these things for a very, very long time, bottom up, you know, all of the things that were being said in the first two wonderful presentations. Guess where I stand at the moment is a feeling of frustration, because although people like us kind of know these things, they're still not common currency, they're still not the way that most things are happening. And in fact, they're a very long way from the way that most things are happening. I live in Scotland, in the north of Scotland, um, and I work at European level, so I kind of get that overview. But, you know, things like um, the land and access to the land and the, the subsidies we provide to farmers and people are actually what are moulding what is happening with the land, you know, and, the, and it's not really in the hands of the majority of people in local communities. It's in the hands of the the people that design the grant schemes, it's in the hands of the people that have got the, the land tenure rights, um, which in Scotland is a very few people. Um, we have a very strange land tenure system here. But also at local level, communities are very disempowered. And generally speaking, I think are more focused on social welfare or you know individual welfare than they are on these bigger issues of sustainability, et cetera. So there's a big gap between where most communities currently sit and the aspirations that we're talking about now in, in these discussions, you know, that professional people might you know, feel quite comfortable with. So, you know, how on earth, how on earth do we build a scale from the, the few communities that do provide very good examples, and we all know of those, to the majority of communities that are probably just carrying on the way they always have with very traditional ideas being subsidized by the wrong kind of subsidies to produce the wrong crops on the wrong land etc 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 these are the barriers that we're facing between this vision and the reality we're currently sitting in mm -hmm. so i thought i'd throw that out just now yeah I think, I think there's something interesting here in terms of how should we get to this ideal vision, because we've been talking about a vision, so maybe we can save this for uh, the second part of the discussion where we're going to talk about the key steps, the uh, key changes that we need to implement to get to that vision. So these are very relevant points. We can probably summarize in terms of good like awareness raising is probably or information and sharing of good practices are some of the of the tools there. So. We can we can definitely go back to this uh, in a few minutes. I would like to hear from Lydia instead if you have uh, now if you have some uh, ideas about the vision. So now we are really insisting on this first part of the breakout room. We want, really want to talk about what where do we want to be in 2040. And I appreciate we need to take into account that there's a there is a gap between a vision and the reality. So that's very important, of course, the reality check. So Lydia, would you like to take the floor? Yes, thank you. I'm Lydia Pavic Rogosic. I represent the European Economics and Social Committee here today, but I am uh, from originally from Croatia, so I have experience from our country as well. And uh, uh, I think it's important when we set up the vision that we have to have in mind that uh, it's uh, di uh, very diverse areas and that we have uh, areas that are close to the big cities, uh, the mountain is uh, very remote uh, island areas and that we can't uh, have uh, 
just uh, you know that uh, we have to take into account this diversity and uh, when we talk about solutions later on that it can't be uh, one solution fits uh, all mm -hmm. and uh, in regards to uh, resilience i think uh, um, it's important to have the partnership uh, between different uh, stakeholders as uh, it was mentioned uh, in uh, our that uh, our previous uh, speakers mentioned and that uh, uh, it's uh, very important when uh, really uh, some disasters happened. We had uh, recently uh, in poor rural areas uh, uh, near Zagreb actually, but uh, huge earthquake and then uh, uh, that's the question how you can act and then everybody has a role. So it's not role just of uh, uh, na national government ministries, uh, but it's also uh, a role of uh, uh, lags, the role of uh, different associations, uh, uh, volunteers. So, so th that diversity that we have to, to see to act in uh, rural uh, areas. And um, I think I believe in bottom up approach uh, uh, through one of the projects of my organization, for First Lag in Creation was established five years before we entered the EU, uh, but still in many areas we need this connection uh, with, uh, uh, with the top-down uh, approach. It should be uh, somehow mm -hmm. um, uh, working uh, together because, uh, and just one uh, more thought, uh, I think uh, somebody mentioned flexibility, but also in financing, but also flexibility of lags and the local uh, rural communities to decide for uh, themselves what is the important for them not to be uh, set up by the ministry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, it's, so it's about empowering also communities yes, really, and this exactly. flexibility, I think it's a good, it's yes, a good word. Forming and empowering and uh, uh, I think Vanessa mentioned that uh, still people are not uh, informed. They still ask uh, what is the lag and what is the role. So, you know, we, we need more uh, information, although we think we inform too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, communication is a never ending task, absolutely. Um, Clive, I think you raised your hand after, right after Idia. Yep. Hello there. Thanks. Yeah, j just about the issue of the vision, I think one fundamental point is really what's happening through COVID. I live in, the, in a mountain village in the French Alps, and one thing that's happened very much since COVID is that suddenly it's becoming a suburb. Mm. It's um, one of the key points now is because so many people want to live in rural areas, there's a huge exodus. And I think there is also this issue in 2040, we actually want the rural areas, particularly those which are relatively close to urban areas, still to be rural and not simply to be suburbs. And I think there's this urbanization of rural areas, which is probably one of the greatest things to avoid. And it's very much as also Vanessa was saying and the other speakers, it's about a question of power, it's about a question of cooperation. Now, in order to achieve this, again for 2040 it's about cooperation between and in rural areas if we are to achieve this autonomy and not simply to become suburbs then that's what we need we it's fundamental for us to cooperate and to have that vision together but above all not simply to be in 2040 an extension even if we may look the same the people who will live here the people who will work here will be tied to urban areas and metropolitan areas and serving their needs. And I think this is perhaps one of the most negative aspects of COVID, certainly where we're living in France and in, um, and in speaking to other people as well, that is a real significant danger. And the answer to that is cooperation and have that common vision and have the political, economic and social will to follow that through. And obviously we'll be speaking about the solutions later on about how that's achieved. But that's it. It's a vision that we are. It's a rural areas for rural areas and not simply suburbs and extensions of urban Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good point. 
Yeah. Does everybody want to build on this? Any comments on this? Kala, Kalai. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much it's, uh, for for uh, having. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to to join you. I'm representing with my dear colleague uh, who, who who told before Lydia uh, Pavic Rogosic, uh, uh, the European Economic and Social uh, uh, Committee, and um, um, uh, what what I missed a little bit. Uh, uh, talking about uh, rural areas, I think it's very important to, to mention, mention social aspects of, of everything. So actually I, I'm coming from uh, uh, trade unions and we are dealing with, uh, with employment issues. And uh, I really think, and I'm a good example, I think because I moved from city to rural areas after COVID. So actually I, I'm just trying in, in the real life to to not only live but uh, maintain uh, myself from a rural uh, rural uh, aspect, and uh, actually I find find very important to 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 create jobs over there to be able to to exist, and uh, we within the European Economic and Social Committee speak uh, speak a lot uh, about um, about several measures, not only the the cap. Which is one of the most important, uh, uh, most important uh, measures, but uh, which is not enough to to solve the problems uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, employment. So I think uh, we should focus more on job creation by contributing to a more di diversified rural economy in rural areas, which is very important and. Uh, and I think this is the only way we can support the settlement of people in rural areas. Yes, I know we have to consider traditional aspects, et cetera, et cetera. But I think without uh, creating jobs in rural areas, we are not able to attract people and use uh, uh, most of all uh, to come back to live in rural areas. And uh, we can see that there are a lot of measures uh, which are uh, rightly conditional or respect for basic environmental standards, public health and animal welfare. Compliance with human and labor rights plays absolutely no role in, uh, in, in these measures. And I think this is very important. So thank you very much. That was uh, uh, all I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Kalai. Zeli, I'm glad to finally meet you in, in, in a meeting because we've been exchanging so many emails. <laughs> so far. Yes. Hello, hello. Maybe in the not too distant future, we might actually be able to bump elbows or something, but at least we can see each other. Um, yeah, I would love to, to come back and to probe a little bit more and to maybe ask a, a question of something that was sparked by um, Mars' uh, lovely vision. And maybe she might like to comment and other people might like to, to come in on this as, as, as well. She rightly commented on rural areas um, being the, the, the source and generating the necessary basic essentials, so um, uh, water and clean air and all these uh, ecosystem services, and that by 2040 they should be recognised for their good stewardship and this should be valued, and I'm absolutely all for that, and I, and I hope that, that we will be... Um, there even before 2040. Um, she also mentioned the the sort of the self-organizing and the basically the the the, the sustainability of, of, of individual communities. So I, I think and correct me if I have, have misunderstood here, but thinking about communities being able to be self-supporting. Um, what I think we also recognize and, and, and comes out of that is that rural areas are generating these services not only to support themselves, but these are essential for the for the urban populations. I mean, water for the urban populations comes from the, the, the catchment areas and the quality of the water and the amount of it is determined by land use and, and that sort of thing. So my questions are about what would people see as the the ideal or, or good transactional basis uh, and what sort of flows and how can these transactions be 
uh, effectively managed and achieved so that there, there is adequate uh, recognition and recompense for the, 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 the provision of these services. So to do with the sort of the networking and the cooperation, okay, you can have rural communities and they might have everything they, they need, but if they're also providing, how would, the, how would you see those transactions happening in, in an optimum way? Thank you. Uh, shall I answer? Yeah, or do you want to open the floor? No, 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 please, it's fine. Everybody's welcome to, uh, to, to intervene, but please, I see still hands raised, so I don't know if the, um, all the others want to reply, but I think this was specifically addressed or built on your presentation, Mar, so please go ahead and then, yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Sally. That's not an easy question to, to answer, as uh, uh, I guess all of us agree. But uh, we are living in a society where communication, where uh, image, where uh, these things are like uh, the, the important issues or that is changing everything. So we need to, to move from, from a, an idea that all these things are for free and that just happened because I don't know, an invisible hand if you want, or a lovely godness that makes for us. And to give the only people, urban and rural people, the idea of how valuable are these things. So they cannot be without a price and they cannot be appropriated only for by some as it's happening, right? So if we have very, very cheap uh, food, and in return, we have very expensive, like for instance, clothes. People is ready to pay a lot of money for a branded clothes and not for a good food that is going inside us. So we need to, to do a real communication campaign to make everybody understand the real value of these goods and services and to make them understand that this is essential for our life. We cannot live without a Water, we need good food, healthy food, nutritional food. We need uh, clean air. Uh, we need uh, for our uh, a well, well being and welfare, lovely landscape, and to have access to natural resources. We do not want enclosure that prevent us to using this, even if it is in private hands, should be a right of access to all these things. And food should be human rights. All of us should have the right to, to have food, uh, healthy food. So I think first thing to do is to communicate, to change the views on that and do not, uh, people should not believe that that's for free or that's for granted and that people doing that are the people with the lowest expectation, with the lowest salary, with the lowest qualification, should be just the opposite. To all these things should be valued, recognized, communicate and prized. That's uh, my, my vision. I, I know it's an ideal vision, but I work a lot in the scenarios and in, in thinking differently. So uh, I know it's quite difficult to get on that, but if we do not, do not imagine something different, we never got it. At least maybe I'm utopian, but I like to be like this. Imagination and communication. Some good words are coming up. Um, I don't know who raised a hand first, but I think Vanessa, maybe? So, uh... Okay, thanks. I, I, given that I answered the, the second question in my first statement, <laughs> I thought I'd just say something about the first question. Um, just to put forward, you know, just a sort of a very brief thought about it, that I see this future we're talking about to do with equality of access. And when I say access, I mean to things like land, to assets, to funds, to money, and to power and decisions. And that that is spread you know, across rural areas. It is not concentrated only in the bigger populations. And the second thing is equality of access to opportunity. And in that, I mean things like living standards, You know that, that you, you are entitled to good living standards opportunity to work, you know, so all the things that you can do in a city, you should be able to do in the countryside as well. And we have all the digital and everything else means to help that now. We just have to make that happen. Um, because at the moment, I'm afraid young people still find that they have to go to cities to get the better jobs. Um, and I wanted to just raise something that I, I talk about all the time, but it was an utter inspiration to me was working with Norway. And probably some of you know 
Norway, but in the Norwegian constitution, they have a, a statement, I don't know the exact wording, which is that wherever you live in Norway, you are entitled to live at the same standard of living. Now in Norway, you, they don't talk about rural development because they don't need to, because they have this in their constitution and everything they do in their policies are to do with rolling out the, the, what you need in terms of policy to enable people to live at the same standard of living, even if they live in a tiny little mountain village or they live in a bigger town. And, you know, I think somehow we've missed that in many countries, you know, this, this right that all people should have should be underwritten into all our constitutions if you have one. <laughs> I think that's a very good point, builds on what uh, we heard before about rural areas that should stay rural and not become, not become suburbs, about the importance of retaining and attracting rural populations. And I have to apologize if you hear some background noise. I have a very nervous dog at home today. I'm really sorry. <laughs> That's the joy of working from home. Um, and Lydia and then Kale, I think you have your hands raised, both of you. So whoever wants to begin. Uh, yes, actually, I, I think I didn't lower my, my hand. But anyhow, I think uh, uh, what I wanted to mention, and I forgot the importance of mobility and accessibility of uh, rural uh, areas. And uh, uh, we talk about the new modes of transport and so on. But uh, uh, many of those lines, either uh, are buses, either are uh, 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 railway, they are not uh, profitable. So uh, in, importance of public service obligations are very important. We don't have to for, uh, forget that because uh, first we want, uh, we talk about uh, environment and we want less emissions. Uh, and the second, we, uh, many rural inhabitants, they don't uh, have uh, 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 cars, so they, they can't uh, access to the services, uh, many services. And second thing, I put it in a chat uh, uh, because we st uh, start to talk uh, about COVID-19, but uh, one good thing uh, from that happened that people in, um, in urban areas start to think about importance of uh, how to get food and the importance of short supply chain. I think that's really uh, important uh, because before that uh, only few people, I would say in big, uh, big uh, cities think of that. Now uh, these short uh, supply chains uh, are really uh, popular and that's also uh, connected with digitalization because uh, uh, social media and uh, uh, are really helping in uh, con informing uh, uh, people in the, uh, let's say, in the urban areas, but also connecting and uh, ordering food and so on. I think that really builds also on the point of the need for recognition of rural areas and, areas. and how they matter to all of us. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, Kalei, you lowered your hand, so I suppose it was left from before. So I would give the floor to Clive again. Okay, yeah, <laughs> thanks again. Yes, I will. Just a, a few points, and one is draw, um, following up from Nidia. One of the things that we're trying to do now, in fact, we're starting a project looking at this issue of short supply chains is, yes, it's been wonderful in um, the funding that has happened in COVID is that not only in urban areas, but rural areas, this has been recognized. But the next step when you're looking about solutions is looking at this as a question of the vision, not, not the vision of the future, but the practical steps. Many of these local schemes, I, this I'm talking here about um, in Burgundy, Franche Comte in the center of France, they, many exist now, there's ones for wines, there's platforms for wines, there's platforms where you can um, now look, look at a whole range of different local foods. There are systems which enable you to order and there are central collection points. It's tremendous what's been happening, but the next thing that we're looking at is how do you actually scale that up? How do you now you unite? How do you link the hubs? How do you look at the logistics? 
How do you look at the ordering systems? How do you look at the business business connections? It's all of these different areas of cooperation, the finance, to actually make this a far more important and resilient sector. Because individually, yes, they, they do fantastic things. But if we want to make this a fundamental part of the of the agri-food sector, and a, a study in Brittany recently showed that and it's three to four percent of food is sold through these direct supply mechanisms. If we're going to make that up to 10, 20, which will make a tremendous difference, how do we do that? So we're starting to put in the, a project which is also looking at how the new technologies, how you can apply artificial intelligence, not just to supermarket supply chains or to the large scale production systems, but actually to the issue of local food. So that's just a solution. It's actually looking at what we want, which is to support the growth of local food chains, how we can use modern technology, how we can scale it up, but not scaling it up in the, in the let's say, more capitalist sense, it's scaling it up to enable a multitude of smaller and local producers and, and also solidarity producers from other parts of Europe and the world to cooperatively trade and really meet the needs of urban and rural consumers. So it's just looking at that, we, we've got to have the research which is meeting our needs, not only the needs of the tech or of the larger scale regions and enterprises. I like that point very much. Thank you very much, because indeed, when you say upscaling, immediately we think about just you know, getting it to a larger share of the market or be bigger in size, but that's not the growth we are looking, you're mentioning. That's very good. We have a couple of minutes left. I would like to summarize the key messages I may I could take and from from these discussions so you can say if I've missed something big or I've misunderstood completely so uh, oh Ma Mar also Mar, you raise yeah, your hand I, may no. I say very quick sure uh, following Cl Cliff comment is the also this idea that we need like cheap innovations uh, because normally we have very sophisticated innovation that are very expensive so it's very it's very difficult to scale up up. So we need to invest much more, do much more research in identifying cheap ways of uh, spreading innovation or to uh, use new technologies, but not the very expensive one that is going to be very difficult to have everywhere. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you very much. That's a good point. So um, I'll try to summarize things and I hope I, I report back in, in the okay way, in acceptable way from this session. There was a lot of, of, of interesting points. I think when we talk about the vision, for me, the key points are we've talked about territorial cooperation. So in terms of cooperation at the local scale within the rural area, with the neighboring areas, with uh, the, the, the rural urban relationships, um, the connection between the local and the global. So it's really that part. We've talked about also the recognition uh, of the role and the importance of, of rural areas so that they are not just, um, that they are not marginalized or subordinated to urban areas anymore. So that they are attractive, that's the vision. Uh, they stay rural, they don't become suburbs. Uh, and also that they offer, they should offer uh, the same opportunities you can get in cities in terms of uh, uh, living standards, in working opportunities, job, dynamic job offer, and so on, so they can retain and attract population. We talk about multi-level governance and we talked about access. I wonder maybe the multi-level governance is probably more one way to get to this vision after all. Um, and then when we speak about the how do we how we get there, we've heard about bottom up bottom up action, so enabling bottom up action, uh, awareness raising, empowering communities. We've heard about the need for flexibility in policies, but also in mindsets, um, about the importance of communication uh, to raise the awareness of the importance of rural areas, and also. Um, now, more recently, the, the, one of the last points of scaling successful local initiatives so that they can be replicated elsewhere. I think we've got like 10 seconds left. Anything big I've missed? <laughs> if you have a keyword, say it now. <laughs> I'm saving the chat, so. Uh... I thought, what did I do? Did I push a button? But I didn't do anything. But you're back into all together, which is fine. I made my point in the chat, so. Thank you so much uh, and welcome back. And we were cut off when, when uh, Marion wanted to speak. So if Marion is here, please feel free to share your, your point in the chat with us. Okay. Thanks, yeah. 
sorry about that. And we were just got up. And also sorry about my sound. We discussed it during my session. At the moment, it's a technical problem. I cannot do anything without that. Even, even using a, an external cooler for my laptop doesn't help. So sincere apologies. <laughs> OK, so let's wait a little bit more while everybody is back. I think there's a little response. Um, they all coming at once. Yeah, and okay. I hope you. I hope your discussions went well in the in the breakout sessions, and I hope you found them interesting. Certainly, we had we had a lot of points uh, noted, and uh, I would now like us to to look at uh, the key messages from each session. I'm looking at our middle board, which is full of ideas <laughs> and uh, full of full of very very interesting points. And I was actually struggling to highlight anything from our points that, that should be very much highlighted because everything seems to be very important, but I make the, my best effort to, to give you the, the most important points of these. Uh, I try to share my screen. And if I fail, I would like to ask the, the technician colleagues to share this middle board, uh, but let, let me try first. And then we go to, once I've succeeded, uh, we would like to go through each session one by one and look at the most important points, which will give me also time to highlight the most important points in my uh, middle board. Just a second. So let's try. Can you see this? Yes. Yep. Okay, great, great. We, we see the much. four boards. Okay, so I need to go back to my screen and try to bring this into the center. Uh, so let's try to talk about the communities first, if possible. And I'm trying to enlarge the communities part of the session. You can follow also the facilitators can also follow on their own screen. So Elena, please, if you can start and then uh, sure. talk about the most important ones. Yeah, as you can see, I've tried to highlight some key messages. It wasn't easy because it was a very intense discussion and lots of participation. So when we talk about uh, the vision, we spoke about several things, but I think the key points were about the recognition of the role and importance of rural areas for all of us. And this has to do with the fact that, so that's the vision, a vision of the future where, where the importance of rural areas in terms of food production, in terms of quality of air, in terms of all the things, all the value and assets they provide for everyone and society are recognized. So rural areas are not more marginalized, they are not uh, subordinated to urban areas, they are really recognized as equal players. Um, and also importantly, that they remain real rural areas, they don't just become suburbs, um, which is what is happening in some cases. Um, and also the vision is of rural areas that offer the same opportunities you can get in, in cities in terms of uh, uh, working opportunities, in terms of uh, um, good living standards, equal opportunities for all. Um, and this is important so that the rural areas can retain and attract uh, people and particularly youth. Um, we've talked about accessibility uh, in terms of transport, but also accessibility in terms of equality of access to land, assets, money, power, and decision making. And then we spoke a lot also about uh, territorial cooperation in the sense of the importance of cooperation within the rural areas, cooperation with the neighboring areas, uh, rural urban relationships, uh, cooperation at the regional level, but also the connection between local and global, uh, and global levels. So these were the, the four main points. And how do we get there? Um, importance of bottom-up action. So raising awareness and empowering communities, all these come together. Um, and I think an important point was that because the population is so diverse, then if you involve everyone, you can define, you can design more effective strategies to face different challenges. Um, and then we need flexibility in terms of policies that can support uh, these uh, local strategies, but also flexibility of mindsets. I think that's important for resilience. You need to be flexible. Um, and also, uh, importantly, the importance of communication, communication campaigns that can raise awareness of the importance of rural areas for all. Um, and finally, the uh, importance to upscale successful local initiatives 
not for a for a um, um, for, a, for a purely economic uh, uh, advantage, but upscaling in the sense that they, this enables replication. So the successful initiatives can be replicated on a, on a bigger scale or um, in other places. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Paul, uh, Peter. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for reminding me as well. Now I'm trying to move the screen to environment and ask. Uh, Laura to, Thank you. to share their main points with us. Thank you. Yes. So we discussed uh, the environmental dimension of resilience and the starting point was to acknowledge that um, responsible management of natural resources, uh, the, the, the uh, balance in the environment, in, in, in uh, climate action, it's really at the very heart of resilient rural areas. And um, we also recognize that uh, currently at a very high level in Europe with the Green Deal, there are many policy uh, areas, many strategies that already do point to the right direction in which regards um, safeguarding biodiversity, moving into more sustainable food systems, uh, um, clean energy, uh, the whole climate package and so on. And uh, we said that what is now very essential is to make sure that the long-term vision for rural areas is fully in line with these Green Deal objectives for the environment and climate. And the, 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 the vision has to really recognize the centrality of ecosystem services and climate solutions and the role of rural areas in, in providing these. And uh, then we made the comment that policy and its implementation are two different things. So the steps ahead now is to uh, ensure that the member states move and, and uh, that these good policy intentions are, are actually put to practice. And here we said that the local initiatives can be really showing the way and uh, the active engagement of local communities and also the networking, the, the interconnectedness of, of local communities through different networks, um, at the European level, for example, or amongst themselves, can be a pulling factor also for, for um, advancing responsible policy implementation. Um, so local communities have a very important uh, role in, in, uh, in translating that policy into practice. And other key issues that were mentioned were, of course, uh, I'm talking about the steps ahead now, uh, the availability of resources, including funding, but not only funding, it's also about expertise, examples, uh, knowledge. And uh, in this, uh, with this regard, it was also mentioned that the current cap reform is quite an important policy uh, process and um, and there is potential for it to be uh, to align with this uh, green transformation and, 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 and uh, resilience uh, objectives and uh, the member states here are in key position. So again, from in that regard, the, 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 the example shown by local communities can be very important here. And uh, other interesting things that were mentioned were also, for example, the, the, what is the actual place and potential of local innovation? We have been referring a lot to local innovation in these workshops uh, during the two days. Uh, you have to remember that local innovation has its specific place and uh, it can solve especially local level issues, but uh, we might need to avoid uh, putting too much expectations on, on local level innovation as well, especially when, uh, you think about global environmental problems, uh, global, global or regional big environmental threats, they might not be solved with local innovation only. That's Thanks. it. Thank you so much, Laura. Rich material again. And uh, let me try and move to the economy section. Move the economy section in the middle of the screen for, for Myers to talk about. Please, Myers. Okay, so um, just to, unfortunately, we ran out of time. We had a very lively discussion, so I wasn't able to share the board with uh, the group. So feel free for anyone to chime in uh, if I missed something or if you want to clarify something. Um, so one of the things we kind of uh, first discussed about the economy is oftentimes when we talk about economy in rural areas, there becomes this kind of dilemma 
about how to handle efficient institutions and at the same time have a good local economy which is included because oftentimes there's this kind of idea that there's economies of scale and oftentimes when you start scaling up then services are taken actually out of the rural areas uh, into maybe more urban areas or kind of centralized so how do we you know continue to keep efficiency but keeping them also kind of at the local level so that was one aspect that we really uh, we talked about um, we also talked about kind of uh, similarly in terms of kind of a, the ideas of efficiency and how oftentimes economics looks at efficiency uh, this idea that maybe it costs money in kind of the short term to keep people in rural areas and maybe in an economic point of view this seems like a kind of inefficiency but in the more long term it's something that's definitely important and viable so while this can kind of look like an inefficiency from an economic point of view, it actually isn't really um, in the longer term. Uh, then we move over to this idea that kind of, and this has also been brought up in some of the other workshops, this idea to keep or build up dense circuits of artisanal areas um, and how this can help to kind of bring uh, people to rural areas. Um, so this is a bit moving towards the second part. Additionally, we, we did say that actually concerning COVID, uh, rural areas did appear to be actually very resilient in many ways to things like COVID. And this is why people have an have a interest in kind of moving to rural areas now, a heightened interest and in what we call kind of multi-local living. So going off of that, um, kind of going towards future steps, we said one, we need to kind of change the mindset of people in a way, a positive way towards rural living. Um, and in many ways, actually, we said that COVID has done a great job with that. People are already, their mindsets are changing towards working from home, working from rural areas, things like this. While on the other side of things, uh, we said that there's a huge need for infrastructure, especially like broadband, uh, to be to keep up with these kind of trends because if these don't keep up with these trends then people will kind of you know hit a critical max point uh, where they can't move to the rural areas because they can't you know their kids maybe can't connect for their school or something like this so one person said that you know broadband should actually be rolled out as quickly as the covid vaccine to these rural areas to keep people there um, and other things like daycare other services the other thing that we said is also there needs to be a re-diversification of rural areas. So often have rural areas, just like everything in our society, they have become increasingly specialized, which makes them increasingly fragile to shocks. For example, if a town relies specifically on tourism and then COVID hits and no one can go there, they become very fragile. So they need to re-diversify their interests and their economies. The last thing I would say is really to invest in urban rural relations, that by investing in these kind of relations, you know, the rural areas can really be kind of maybe not the backyard of, of urban areas, but they can complement urban areas in every way and people can move easily uh, between them and therefore the economies can share from each other. So, thank, thank you. you very much, Miles. And I would like to pick up where you left off at your final point and the I'm, I'm sincere about it. We haven't discussed this in, in advance, but uh, we talked uh, quite a lot about, uh, and it was it was a very important point mentioned by by quite a lot of our participants in the group, is that we have to look at uh, rural urban relationships in a new way. We have to recognize the interdependencies between rural and, and urban areas, and we have to recognize the flows between them. We have to recognize that they are dependent on each other, and this is. This is something we have to consider in building in building resilience of rural areas. It, it doesn't go alone. It's not just building the resilience of the rural area as an isolated unit, but, but looking at it in, in terms of its relationships. Uh, another very important point that was mentioned is that uh, social capital, new types of relationships and ways of working together within the specific rural area uh, are crucial. Uh, they are crucial because we don't, do not just want to bounce back from a crisis. This, this is not enough for real resilience. Real resilience means that you can bounce forward from a crisis to build, build better uh, than before, than the state uh, before the crisis. So you have to improve uh, and look at the crisis also as a, as a sort of an opportunity. 
The data was mentioned as a very important thing that, that should be the basis of, of, of building this, this new type of uh, interactions as well and new types of communities. Uh, one very important point, uh, and the last one that I'm going to emphasize, all of them are important here, but I think it's very important to know that, that you know, need to know your natural boundaries in the sense of not only by, as a bioregion, or in a biological sense or a natural science sense, but also in terms of culture, traditions, economy. You need to know your territory intimately and you need to build a community based on that, based on that knowledge. Uh, we have uh, talked about the, the artificiality and arbitrariness of, of administrative boundaries, for example, which do not always uh, go along the lines of natural boundaries or geographical boundaries. Uh, in terms of, uh, and of course, food supply was also mentioned as an important part of, of, of local resilience. Uh, the two important messages in terms of steps to take by 2040 to get to rural resilience and diversity is uh, one of them is if you look inside the rural community or rural area, rather, uh, we need to create real communities, communities of people, businesses public sector working together. So that's, that's a challenge and that's something that needs to be tackled in the upcoming period if we want rural areas to be resilient. And the other challenge and the other main step also is we need to provide support to communities and community action, meaning that its uh, support is not only available to specific businesses or specific uh, NGOs or specific uh, local municipalities, but for community action where all of these can work together, actually. So these were the two main, two main points to, to consider as, as steps ahead. So I stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for all this uh, that you have shared with us now. And I, I would like to take us back to the discussion a little bit. We still have four minutes. <laughs> Uh, and for any final views, any anything that we have missed, maybe I I'm also checking the chat. Uh, I hope it's not all about my sound only. Just a second, and in the meantime, please raise your hand if you have anything to add to this. So I see uh, a contribution from Beersley on the environment theme, uh, knowing for a fact that local action can improve resilience. I think it's a very interesting, significant part of Southern Europe. Uh, it's again a challenge that will become unlivable because of drought and heat. Uh, and this has to be get, get, uh, tackled, floods and storms. Uh, all of these relate to to uh, the climate change challenges. Um, checking other messages in the chat. Yes, Bettina agrees with, with Bill on this. We need to understand raise awareness. Awareness is a very important point and it has been raised in, 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 in many discussions, also in previous workshops, but also I think when we build a community and when we build community resilience, we need to be aware of, of this, uh, the importance of this as well. Okay, any last point from you, from your side maybe? Well, maybe Peter, uh, if I can just add Please. to what I already said from our, our group, I, I, I see, uh, you know, linkages between the economy and the environment. Uh, when it comes to diversity, everybody's saying that diversity is at the heart of resilience and it, it's the same thing uh, talking about different um, eco economic strategies, but also about biodiversity. And I, I think this is really, really, key for the whole discussion on resilience. So diversity at all aspects in rural areas has to be preserved and, and incentivized. I think this Great. is important. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So now we've got about one, one and a half, one minute left. Uh, and I think what remains for me to do now is to thank you all for your contributions, for your activity. Special thanks to our speakers. I hope you have enjoyed all the speeches. Mario has come back. I want to give you the chance for a, for a very quick uh, 
you if you if you want to because we left off uh, the breakout group any any points that they missed but really very quickly because i need to thank you thank you thank you i uh, i'm off for running this is why i changed the okay, cut of sorry, the camera i'm <laughs> sorry but uh, i uh, uh, i uh, wrote it also in the chat that i think uh, that community led local development is a great tool for uh, for uh, enhancing resilience because we can uh, we can map uh, the area we can engage citizens and and then work together on a common goal and i think uh, this is a great way to to use it and uh, i so there were some other that that agreed on that so that was all i wanted to say thank you very much maria yeah. so all, all i have to finish off with is thank you very much again thanks to all the speakers thanks to all the technical uh, colleagues in the background who helped us out uh, thanks to our keynote listener who will work with us on trying to synthesize all these messages together. I would like to, to invite you to enjoy the rest of the week, the rest of the sessions. Of course, please do not forget the plenary sessions on Friday. And very importantly, and we also shared it in the chat, there is still the Rural Inspiration Awards where you can actually still vote if you haven't done so yet. So please do. Uh, Check, check this out, check out the nominees and, and vote on the Rural Inspiration Awards. Thank you very much again and goodbye for now and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.